A few years ago, I attended a public event at SFMOMA for Alafur Eliasson. I don't know if any of you were there, but it had a huge impact on me. Um, I went to go hear Alafur Eliasson speak, and instead, I heard a neurobiologist, a snowflake scientist, and um, TJ Clark, who's an art historian. And I don't even remember if Olafur spoke that night. It was amazing. It was the most amazing night. And we've actually modeled our public programs off of that event ever since. We like at the Arts Commission to build a broader dialogue around the works that we show. Not just having the artists themselves present, but to present different ways of thinking about their work, different ways of thinking about contemporary art in general, and leaving you thinking as you leave. Um, so tonight we have someone from the De Young, and we have a photographer um, who is not in the show alongside one of our current exhibiting artists. Um, if you like this program, you'll like other things that we do in terms of our public programs. Um, Tonight we'll hear our featured artist and then from our invited guests who I'll introduce in turn. If there's time, I'll direct a couple of questions in their direction. There will be no Q&A tonight. This program wasn't designed as a dialogue, so there will be no Q&A. Um, we hope that you leave thinking and hope that you'll attend the exhibition before it closes on April 27th. On with the introductions. We're going to start with our exhibiting artist, Bernard Schmilde, who is in the blue shirt over here, lives and works in Amsterdam. He received his BA in 2001 from the Minerva Academy and his MA in 2005 from the Frank Moore Institute, both in Holland. He has exhibited across Holland and also in Toronto, Taipei, Istanbul, Dublin, Paris, London, Rotterdam, many others, and now San Francisco. Last month, he opened his first large-scale solo exhibition in the US at Land of Tomorrow in Louisville, Kentucky which I didn't know about. I encourage you all to look up that, um, that institution. It's an incredible, incredible space and program. Um, his work resides in both the Saatchi and Smithsonian collections, among others. Bernard's work has been written about extensively in art publications. Additionally, his Nimbus work, which will be introduced to tonight, was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 inventions of 2012. Bernau is represented by uh, Ronchini Gallery in London. And now I'd like to have him come up and speak. All right, so I'm Bernard. I'm uh, based in Amsterdam and uh, I'm going to show you a few works. So, um, yeah, my work um, consists of uh, installations, sculptures and photos, and um, I often work corresponding to site and reacting on the architecture or history of the location. So um, that's why I wanted to start with this work. Uh, I'm interested in the moment of friction between construction and deconstruction. And this could be um, referring to the building, physical state of a building, as also to a, a, a moment of revelation that depicts hope of per or perishableness. And, but um, in these transitional situations, you're not really sure what you are looking at, and, um, nor does it have a clear function yet, and therefore it's open for interpretation. And that aspect I find um, really interesting. And um, as for in this work, um, board art, it's really the, the space that is important, because um, it's the location, the museum, that um, gives the context to this, um, changes the interpretation of this painting while it's resting against the wall for a brief abandoned moment. Um, I will, yeah. And um, so I often work with situations that deal with duality and the question inside and outside and size, the function of materials and architectural elements. And um, I, yeah, I, I find it interesting when a work um, functions in between reality and representation that it will in the end not really function, and that's also a good example is also the work um, as Skeet, and that is also in um, the show at the gallery at the moment. And um, so this work is called Until Skeet and Has Street View. And um, in 2009, I participated in a, in a residency in Ireland. 
And when I looked for information, I was directed in, uh, I was directed to uh, Wisconsin. And um, so Eskiton Island is one of the oldest towns in Ireland. And uh, well, around the 1840s, lots of Irish people immigrated to the US due to the potato famine. And a few people from Wisconsin set up a new town in, um, in Wisconsin, which they also named uh, Eskiton. And if you look on Google Maps, you'll find the street view of Eskiton. And the first building you see is a barn, a typical red barn. And I found it interesting that um, well, the original town hadn't been photographed by Google yet. And um, also this idea of when you're looking for some original, you find a duplicate. So um, I copied this barn and placed this facade or, or prop on the most resembling location in the original town of Ireland. And um, the idea was that if, well, the Google photo car would come by, <laughs> that this same image would be picked up and the barn would exist in, in both Eskitans. <laughs> so it was up for, for two weeks, but I knew the, the, the car was in the, in the neighborhood in Limerick City. But um, yeah, that was, that was the idea. But recently I found out that after two years, it did. So now, um, there is a Google Street View of Eskitan with the same house. <laughs> and, um, and I really like that idea of transition where you then take an image from the internet, put it in the real world, well, to be captured and then placed back online. So that really questions um, realities and that's also what I'm interested in. So now we go to the, um, to the cloud works, the Nimbus works. Um, the Nimbus works, well, present a short moment of presence on a distinct location and you could, you could look at them as a, as a, as an omnia situation maybe, or just an element from, from a classical painting. And um, well, I'm really interested in the, in the temporary aspect of the work. So it's just there for a few seconds and then it falls apart. And um, so the work exists, uh, yeah, the physical aspect is important, but the work exists in the end as a photograph. And this photograph functions, well, as a document of something that happened on a specific uh, location. Um, also, the space um, well functions basically as a as a as a plinth for the work, and um, with every space, I try to keep a connection to an exhibition space, also to uh, to keep a relation to the artwork, and also because yeah, um, well you could ask yourself if a sculpture could exist of of just well exposed air basically, and um, so I'm not so much interested in the whole process of making the work, of making the clouds, but rather in the idea of um, the image of a cloud inside a space. Um, the first cloud I made in, an, um, in the small scale space, uh, Probe, which is an exhibition space. It's a, yeah, it's a small, it's a model space. The walls aren't, aren't higher than, uh, I think about, what is it, three foot? Yeah. Um, so because it is a model space, it enables you to create works that are unthinkable in real life. So, um, and because you have fully control of that space, I thought it would be, um, I thought of the idea of would it be possible to exhibit a rain cloud. And also because you have total control, you start making, well, you start making an ideal uh, situation actually. And therefore I think that a model can also well, stand for an idea. So what I did is I uh, transformed the um, exhibition space into my ideal perception of a museum space, which was the National Gallery in Dublin, which also was in the first image, and um, well, and presented a, tried to uh, exhibit a rain cloud. And um, I really like that, well, the fleeting idea of the, of the work, that it builds up and falls apart at the same time. So after that, I started working in conventional size spaces. And um, so, yeah, the locations are important um, for the work and also, um, well, making the work in an um, exhibition space is also putting it in relation to art and to the history of that space. And also, like for instance, the one before in the, um, in the museum space, you could say it's also related to painting um, in that way. You could think of it maybe as an escape element from a cloud, uh, from, a, from a landscape painting in a physical form. And in this case, this, um, this chapel also, well, it emphasizes the more the uh, the defined and, and fleeting connotations of the work. So, um, um, 
well, yeah, but whether you see it as a, as a threatening or defined situation, just by taking the cloud out of its natural context and presenting it in a, in a space itself um, provides the opportunity to uh, protect lots of ideas on it. And um, all the spaces I use, the architecture is quite important. And I kind of, most of the time they are presented as ideal space. This was, an, uh, this was something totally different. In this exhibition, I showed the work together with other works, which were quite solid. So in this exhibition, only the cloud exists in the form um, of the catalog. And in the exhibition, it is, it is gone. Um, but um, well, I make the clouds with a um, combination of smoke, moist, and uh, backlighting. And in every space, it works different. So this is more an industrial space. Also here, it's more like a, a weather situation than an archetypical um, cloud, almost. But by, um, I do other, yeah, but in, on my research on how to make clouds, I run into um, this material. This is called aerogel. And um, aerogel is also called um, frozen smoke. And it consists of 99.8% um, air. And it's the lightest solid material on Earth. NASA used it for um, collecting interstellar dust. And, um, well, it's, it's, it's got a beautiful bluish shine. And you can, like, look right through it. And um, so what is... What I did is I placed it on small models of exhibition spaces. And for me, it resembles the same idea as the Nimbus works. Basically, they're just air on, a, on an empty space. But what I like about this as well is that it's an artificial material. And it's just a little bit more dense than air. And um, so these are other spaces. And therefore, it resembles also, of, um, presents also the idea that, um, that our human urge to, to compete with nature and um, yeah, that's what I think is interesting about it. So, um, other than that, I work, yeah, I like materials and I work a lot with um, construction materials and artificial uh, elements, but also with scent. And, and this work, the conditioner works, the, it, it, they consist of, they exist of a gallery, of, of a, a ventilation shaft leading through the gallery. And what it does is it converts the air from the gallery into antiseptic air. And therefore, the antiseptic air for me associates with, um, well, with hospitals and sickness, death maybe. But on the other hand, you know this, um, this air is clean and safe on any bacterials. And therefore, you start questioning the space as well. Is it safe here or are you truly safe? What's the place trying to protect me from? So this work is also really about duality. This piece is called um, Unflattened, and um, I projected the color spectrum onto a, a landscape, making that idealistic landscape even more desirable. So um, the suggestion of a rainbow, well, it can be seen as a sign of promise or perfection, but by turning it upside down, you um, start questioning these values again. So again, that's changing. So this ideal, uh, what at first looks like an ideal landscape can also, sunrise can also be interpreted as, a, as an apocalyptic image, maybe. And this last image, well, really shows a, a detail of an almost kitsch aspect of it, which I, which I quite like. So um, it's not that I'm really interested in nature, but um, it's more like the ungraspable, the ungraspable aspect of nature that uh, I find interesting, and all the meanings and ideas and myths people have created through them, through, uh, through time. And I, I work with that. Well, that's it. <laughs> Great, so next up, I'm going to introduce um, Doug Rickard, who was born in San Jose and studied history and sociology at UC San Diego, receiving his BA in 1994. Doug is the founder of two successful and critically acclaimed websites. American Suburb X, founded in 2008, is described as an ever-growing archive and fiercely edited look at photography's always relevant past, rapidly shifting present, and dramatically unfolding future. And these Americans, which is an American historical and cultural photographic archive organized by theme.
His most recent work, A New American Picture, is comprised of digitally photographed images derived from Google Street View. Rickard's cropped panoramic images capture sites in America where rates of poverty and unemployment are high, education opportunities are slim, and racial inequality looms. Photographs from A New American Picture were included in the new, uh, the new photography a new Photography 2011 exhibition at uh, MoMA in New York, and also has been seen in exhibitions at Le Bal in Paris and at Pier 24 here in San Francisco. A monograph was published, co-published in 2012 by the Aperture Foundation and Koenig Books. Doug is represented locally by Wirtz Gallery, and the SFAC galleries would like to thank Stephen Wirtz and the staff for their support of this event. We've asked Doug to speak today in order to draw threads from his work to Bernau's Until Askeaton Has Street View, which is currently on view in the gallery. Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate it. Looking forward to giving you some details on this. Um, I have 15 minutes, so I'm not going to talk about all of them. There's so many layers of consideration to this, and each of these areas could sort of veer off into its own talk. And so I'm going to try to talk to some of the things that uh, may overlap with uh, Bernhardt's work. Also, I want to go through the pictures and let you guys really just look at the pictures also and uh, absorb sort of what they mean and how they impact you. The, the pictures speak volumes, and uh, I think you'll get a lot just by absorbing that. So the way that these were made, they were made through Street View. I took a three-year period, started in 09, and basically explored our American cities in depth, in granular fashion, neighborhood by neighborhood, not every city, but places that I was interested in looking at. and. Uh, I started making pictures and amassed uh, a large archive, probably 10,000 images that I made throughout this period, and I whittled it down to around 80 to make this work. I'll describe some of the dynamics of Street View and sort of the implications. So we, we sort of know at this point firmly that photography only is partial truth. It really is affected by so many variables that you get half truths and half uh, varying context that some some of which you bring in yourself. And what happens is a photographer takes a moment of time, in this case, one second in a place, and we're left to look at it and make uh, assessments and judgments and, and make you know our, our own backstory to the images. And so there's an element of this that we don't really know the truth. We sort of see what we, what, what's in front of us, and we start to take that in and decide, you know, what we think truth is. Google has taken these pictures um, of every inch of our country, for the most part. They're doing it in other countries as well. Uh, some of the other countries are resisting. Germany, places where there's a history of, uh, of, you know, a big brother ass type of regime. Uh, but for the most part in America, we've, we've welcomed it, for the most part, with op open arms, I'd say. We don't see the sort of outpouring and outcry that we see in other countries. But the cars are going around. They're covering uh, a 360-degree view every 30 feet or so. And it's really a, a machine making the images. I've sort of come in and hijacked that machine afterwards and pieced together a narrative from within this ocean of imagery. But they're going along, they're taking the pictures and building up really a, a virtual space from, which in, w from within uh, which I traversed. And it was wild. It's sort of like a frozen world, really. And there's movement of the camera, 360 degrees, but uh, it's frozen. There, there are moments in time uh, in 2007 when this car drove by just like that and then was gone. Most of the time, people don't know there are pictures being taken, and it really bakes into this work something very different than work that would be taken on the street. There's, there's sort of visual connections to street photography, and there's philosophical connections. You know, there's some movement by me, but yet 
the camera was a machine. It was taken from a height of about seven feet, a fixed position. No one was wandering around and choosing sort of varying points of view. And it presented to me this huge canvas of America, you know, that was pretty uh, massive in terms of geography, but yet just a small window, right? We don't see in the, into these people's lives. We don't really know what's happening outside of the frame or where they're going. We don't know anything about them. So I went through exploring places that range from urban areas to you know, small little towns along the border between Mexico and the U.S., uh, little dusty, dusty towns or right in downtown Baltimore. You know, I spent just a huge amount of time doing that. So if you think about it, this robot takes the picture, and it takes a picture consistently from the same place, and it's really, I guess, objective, right? More objective than any uh, person would be taking pictures. Every, every journalist that would take pictures would also present a point of view. There's no point of view, I guess, initially when these pictures were made. Uh, but then I am coming in and creating a point of view from within this ocean of imagery. I'm just going to flip through a few of these and let you look at these. You can see the city name down on the lower left, Macomb, Mississippi. The number next to the... Uh, to the city is a derivative of the GPS marker for this Google location. I took the link and I sort of transposed numbers and used that. I wanted to, to really connotate this virtual world in a way, but yet in a strange way there was also this visual connection to photographic heritage that was pretty wild. On top of this moment in time, there's also a breaking down of the imagery that that happens in the Google pictures themselves. Most of these pictures are lo-fi, and I chose those, I guess, because of the, you know, the, the, the aesthetics. The high def didn't quite contain the same look as these, but it really also erodes sort of truth and makes the lenses a little bit blurry. You know, it, it, it alters things even, even from a, a technical point of view. It's Bronx, New York, right here. So you could see these pictures and sort of describe them as like drive-by pictures. You know, that word drive-by really captures this. They're not necessarily immersive in any way. It's literally a car driving by like that, capturing a, capturing a moment. Some of this has been done in the past. Walker Evans took pictures uh, out of a moving vehicle. In fact, strangely, right upstairs in the library before this talk, I was looking through uh, my site and I have on there a gallery uh, from Evans that's called Drive-By Pictures. And it's about 30 images of him flying down the road in Mississippi and Georgia and taking pictures of uh, shotgun shacks and so forth from this moving car that was zipping along. So there is some, some other photographers that have explored the drive-by. In this case, it was like I was hijacking this vir virtual world and also immersing myself in it. And I, I, I came to know these towns and these places almost in a way as if, you know, I had explored it. it it's really strange, really a strange thing. I know South Dallas super well. I've never been there, but I know it super well. I mean, I know every street. I, I, in my mind, I see the, the layout, the neighborhoods. I know the main streets and the, and the turnoffs. The strange thing, I, I was thinking also before this talk, who would have thought, you know, three decades ago that someone would be presenting a picture of America that was taken by machines and then hijacked, and then represented, and re-shown uh, here in a library in San Francisco. I just, it just struck me as odd. You know, I wondered what some of these uh, prior photographers would have thought about it. But it's sort of a new world. In a way, we're, we're throwing ourselves into a virtual world in a fast and furious way. We're all glued to our phones for everything that we, you know, that we, 
not everything, but we're all viewed for our phones for a lot of what we learn and what we see. And we're increasingly looking at pictures as a language more so than it ever was. Back in prior times, there would have been life magazines and some newspapers. Now, I images are created on, on the order of 30 billion images a year are being added right now annually, and that's growing exponentially. And we're increasingly viewing our world through a virtual space. It's just really on overload. And so this work, I guess, is a, a, a symbol of that in a way. Color was important. I used color to represent America in a way. I wanted what I felt were American colors. Certainly, how, what do you, how do you define American colors? You know, some of these things ex existed within me, and and you know, sort of how I viewed America, right? Some of these places may look entirely different in person. It's, it's like a separate world here. Uh, even though it's, it's, it is reality, this really is a place. This really is a picture right from Google. Anyone can go look up these pictures when they leave here. You can go explore Dallas yourself this way if you want. But in a way, there's these filters that are in front of everything that we view now. It has to do with choice, selection, treatment, the aesthetic how it's broken down or how clear it is. All of, these thing, all of these things sort of enter into the equation here and really make us question what true truth is versus half truth. You know, I, I come from a, a photographic background, so it's different, you know, than uh, than other artists approaching a, a a a platform like this. You can tell that I'm looking for composition and certain themes that a photographer is driven to seek. So just words. My first book that I did of this work, I just opened it. I didn't want an essay or anything like that. And I just came up with keywords like on a, a, a blog or a website. And I wanted the words all over the place, positive and negative, all of it. Basically American words, cheeseburger, Vegas, hooker, levy, armed forces. This is sort of a, an America that I have sort of running through my head and it's filled with uh, uh, lots of themes and conflicting ideals and unifying ideals, human ideals and material ideals, all of it. So I just did this brainstorm over over a, a week or so and just kept jotting down words. I keep sort of riffing into American themes. So screenshot of the front page of my site, These Americans, it's an archive that's massive. And I think that we're, as artists and photographers, are increasingly going to be sifting through archives. How can you not when there's 30 billion images being created? Everyone has a, a, a digital SLR in their hand or a, a 10 megapixel camera in their phone. It's, it's, everyone can make a good picture now, really. Not everyone, but it's not, it, it goes beyond that. And I think we're going to look backwards as much as forwards. We're having all of this information in front of us, and people will sift through it and uh, bring ideas forward. And what you do with ideas probably is going to be uh, the utmost uh, of the utmost importance. So you can see some of the titles. They're pretty loaded, right? It's something that uh, interests me. I guess loaded topics in America, to put it mildly, interest me. This is the ASX site, I've overhauled it. 
I, I published this site. It's a huge archive. I, I looked at the net as unlimited possibilities for for editing and archiving and, and curating and publishing. And I, I just thought it was amazing that I had this power at my fingertips to do anything I wanted, basically, without any sort of limits. Only, only right here was the only limit. So the site really features other people's work. It's, I don't put my work on it. And it's basically, I, I looked at it and thought, well, why can't I do something like Interview Magazine, like uh, Warhol did, or some, some publication? I have the tools. You know, so I started it five years ago, and it's grown into huge proportions. I think when I checked recently, there's about 150,000 unique visitors a month reading it. So it's gotten quite an audience. But really, it's something that out of love. It's just pure passion, and it's also a self-education of mine uh, on display. You know, my own interest. And I think I think I'll wrap it up. Thanks. So yeah, um, for those of you who came in late, um, if you could hold your questions. We're not going to do a formal Q&A, but um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to stick around. And if you want to chat with them one on one, um, they'll be available for a little while to do that. Um, our next panelist is Melissa Buron. And um, Melissa earned her BA from Brown University in 2005 and her MA from the University of London Burbeck in 2007. She previously worked in New York at Christie's Auction House and at Millennia Art Partners Gallery in the Time Warner uh, Center. Her museum experience includes research positions at the Dehesh Museum of Art in New York and the Victorian, Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Melissa has been a member of the curatorial team at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco since 2008 and currently holds the position of assistant curator for European art. Her contributions have supported 10 temporary exhibitions of work from the 15th century, such as the Mourners, tomb sculptures from the court of Burgundy, to the 19th century, including the exhibition Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, and beyond post-impressionist masterpieces from the Musée d'Orsay. She served as the assistant curator for the de Young's current blockbuster, Girl with a Pearl Earring, Dutch paintings from the Mauritz. Forthcoming projects in 2013 include Impressionists on the Water and Matisse from SF MoMA, both to be mounted at the Legion of Honor later this year. We invited Melissa to speak because Bernd now told me that his cloud series is inspired by growing up looking at dramatic skies in Dutch landscape painting. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you to everyone who came out uh, this evening to the main branch of the public library. I felt a little bit today like San Francisco was encased in a cloud with all the fog and the rain and everything. So um, I've literally taken on this assignment with a great personal interest and I'm seeing clouds everywhere. And when Meg first called one morning and introduced herself and told me a little bit about this panel and this project, I thought, oh great, clouds. I know about clouds. I see clouds every day. I work at the Legion of Honor at Land's End, literally on this great expanse of land exposed to the sea with these massive mountains and clouds. And I thought, well, piece of cake, no problem. I'll just talk about clouds. I will explain that it became a much deeper project. But uh, I started this talk thinking about my own biographical relationship with clouds and I just was trolling through photos on my computer and I realized that a lot of the moments that I felt important enough to capture in my own very amateurish photography has something to do with the drama of the sky and the clouds. So here I did my master's degree in London and this is Trafalgar Square and Yorkshire where I did a lot of research and also Paris, where you get these amazing low-lying uh, clouds across the sun. And of course, that all resonates with the paintings that I look at and uh, the work that I curate. And this is, of course, the Legion of Honor and the view looking out across the Golden Gate, Great Golden Gate Bridge, where we get, I think, some of the most dramatic and beautiful skies. 
I recently had the opportunity to go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. for a symposium, and I was walking through their galleries, and I was just got totally photo happy taking all of these pictures of clouds. And then I realized I needed to self-curate <laughs> and really uh, refine it because as I was flying home to San Francisco, I was taking pictures of the clouds outside of the window of the plane. And I thought, okay, right, I just need to synthesize this. And I did a bit of uh, looking around at what other art historians have said about clouds and landscapes. And there's a wonderful series, if you're not familiar with it yet, it's called The Met Connections. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art has essentially produced this series of curators and other staff members talking about themes or other ideas um, that have to do with their, their permanent collection. And of course, what did the chairman of the European Paintings Department choose as his theme? Nothing other than clouds. So I'm in pretty big company here trying to talk about 550 years of clouds and art, but I'll do my best in 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, I also found out in talking about clouds and conversation with other curators that there was recently an exhibition at the Yale Center for British Art that um, exhibited the work of a man named Mark Leonard, who was a paintings conservator at the Getty Museum and is now at Dallas. And he actually has worked on Constable's Clouds over the course of his career, but was so inspired by the work that he's done as a conservator that he actually responded to Constable's Clouds in his own work. So clouds are a very timely topic on many forums. And this is, I just wanted to show you an example. Constable did many, many types of studies of clouds, trying to understand their three-dimensionality and not giving you anything else on the composition other than the shapes of the clouds. And in that way, even though the picture was made in 1822, it's very, I think, contemporary without that context of any figures or space. So then I started, again, back to that point about self-curating, I started to think about when, as an art historian, I really first became aware of clouds in paintings. And of course, I've always noticed them, but when did I first really start to think about them? We did an exhibition in 2011 at the de Young Museum, which some of you may have seen that was um, drawn from the collection of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And I wrote an essay on Montaigne, including his Saint Sebastian, and there's this very interesting little detail in the clouds of Montaigne's St. Sebastian where you have a writer in the clouds um, and art historians have not been able to agree on exactly what this figure is. Is it a king? Is it someone from mythology? But in any case, Montaigne has literally taken that childhood pastime of sitting down and trying to see shapes in the clouds and has literally created this shape in the clouds of his painting. And some of you may have also seen our current exhibition at the de Young Girl with a Pearl Earring. Unfortunately, if you came here to hear me speak about Vermeer and the famous girl, there aren't any clouds in this composition and I couldn't fabricate them. So I wanted to speak a little bit about this other painting that's also in the collection of the Maritz House. And the Maritz House actually has three compositions by Vermeer. This probably was the most famous of his works in their collection up until the publication of Tracy Chevalier's novel, Girl with the Pearl Earring, and a small shameless plug, I'll be doing a conversation with her next Thursday, the 28th, and that will be live, Google Plus streamed, all sorts of fun technology. But before the publication of her book and the subsequent film, this was probably one of the more most famous compositions by Vermeer, certainly probably the most famous of the Maritz House's three paintings. And I just love the way the clouds hang so low on the composition. It's actually much darker on my screen, but this kind of balance between rain clouds and white puffy clouds and the way they interact with the buildings of the city of Delft. This competes with two other paintings in the exhibition, and I won't say which ones they are, that uh, it competes for the, my favorite painting in the exhibition. It's Jakob van Roysdel's view of Harlem with bleaching grounds in the foreground. And one of the most important innovations for 17th century Dutch landscape painters was the way that they approached the sky. For any of you who've tra traveled to the Netherlands, you'll know that there's a very low horizon line, and I was told that the Dutch people, and I could be corrected if this is not true, but anecdotally that the Dutch people call their clouds the Dutch mountains, because the landscape is so low that really you get these massive clouds in the sky, and that's the kind of um, 
important topography to talk about. This is another example by the same artist, and it's a winter scene. And as I move through these images of different paintings from various national schools, I don't want to talk too much over them, but just to let you feel how the atmosphere and the mood is changed by the different kinds of clouds that the artists have chosen to depict. I wanted to also very clearly indicate, it's, it was interesting when I'm putting together this PowerPoint, I don't typically like to put any words on the images on my slides because I like the images to, in that way, speak for themselves. I feel like your eye competes between words and images, but I felt like it was important to differentiate between what's in our current exhibition and what's in our permanent collection. So this is in the temporary exhibition as well. And then I wanted to let the paintings in the temporary exhibition and our permanent collection speak to each other. So then I, I also started going through the permanent collection at the Fine Arts Museums, thinking about all of the ways that clouds are represented in paintings, starting with um, this early 16th century painting by an artist named Chima. And I liked the way that this cloud hovers above the Christ child's head, literally like an extension of his halo. And then you have this dramatic Baroque painting by Matteo Preti, where the clouds are parting. It's like he's parting the Red Sea in the sky. Um, and this very dramatic and emotional way that the clouds are not just hovering, but a part of the action and a part of the drama. And then you get someone like El Greco, who uses clouds in this really violent, really nervous, really um, tense way. The clouds are vibrating with energy, and they surround the figure of St. John the Baptist in this um, very expressive way, but so different than the other kinds of clouds that we were just looking at. And this is a painting by a Norwegian artist named Dahl. And I liked it because we have a nighttime scene. So you think about seeing clouds in the daytime or rain clouds or compositions of clouds that are over beautiful landscapes. But what do the clouds do in this picture when we're looking at the moon through the, the view of the clouds? And this is a painting that's particularly close to my heart. It's a mid-Victorian artist named John Martin. And this painting is his depiction of the aftermath of the great biblical flood. So the clouds are parting, the waters are parting. You can't even see it in this slide reproduction, but in the actual painting, very, very far in the horizon line, you have Noah in the ark, just this tiny sliver. But the way that the clouds almost start to take on a figural representation, I mean, it's like there's a movement of hope and promise coming in the sky. And of course, the skies have this long history of being associated with the heavens and mythology. And you can't talk about clouds without talking about the Impressionists. Also on my mind, since we're planning for the Impressionists on the Water exhibition, which opens at the Legion of Honor, June 1st. And this is a painting by the very well-known Claude Monet. And I was thinking back to um, Constable's clouds, where you don't get any figures. You, don't, you get a horizon line here, so we have a bit more sense of space. It's not just the clouds, but the whole canvas is taken up by water and sky and this very um, architectural way that he's constructed the brushwork of the waves tossing in front of us. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the Surrealists. <laughs> I'm about to install these paintings into what is traditionally our Impressionist gallery at the Legion of Honor, but they're some of the most popular paintings in our collection, and whenever we don't have them on view, I get a lot of comment cards from people saying, where are the Dali paintings? What have you done with them? And um, I think that Dali's approach to many things is very idiosyncratic, but of course his clouds have a very personal vocabulary too. They also seemed almost figural to me, but that they have this um, really expressive intention, for lack of a better way to describe them. I don't think Dolly would have wanted me describing his clouds anyway. <laughs> and then I really loved this image by Magritte because I think that as we've heard from the other panelists, clouds and space and landscape 
all have a very personal meaning and what we project on them is very subjective. And I think that in my own attempt to synthesize, as I said, 550 years of art history into 15 minutes and looking at this really big topic of clouds and skies, I came to realize that there is a very personal vocabulary that artists and art historians and we as viewers project onto these images when we look at them. So I felt really honored to have been asked to participate on this panel because I feel like it's really changed the way that I look at so many kinds of paintings. And I was actually talking to a colleague today about maybe curating an exhibition on clouds and trying to take this project even further because I think there's really um, a lot to be said for something that we take for granted perhaps on a daily basis, but um, much deeper meaning to be read into them. So thank you to Meg, thank you to the panelists, and thank you to our audience. Five hundred and fifty years and fifteen minutes. <laughs> Nicely done. I want to thank our panelists so much to Bernat, Doug, and Melissa. Let's give them one more hand. Thank you. I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, conversation six. I don't know if many of you know this, but is our final exhibition in our current uh, space in uh, main gallery in the Veterans Building. Uh, that whole building is uh, being retrofit for two years. When we reopen in 2015, we'll have 4,400 square feet. Yes! Um, we have 900 square feet right now, so it's going to be a remarkable new space. And we'll be doing a lot of um, sort of uh, institutional soul searching in the next couple of years as to how we can serve the public and how we can create an exhibitions program in our large new facility that um, fills in some gaps here in our cultural uh, strata and how we can serve um, a wide variety of artists and communities and represent um, San Francisco in a way that we do currently, which is by showing regional artists alongside of artists from other places, developing a dialogue between the local, the national, and the international. So we'll carry that forward in our new facilities. In the meantime, we'll continue to program at City Hall and at the window installation site. So we're not going dark. We're just uh, putting on hold one of our three different uh, programs. And I want to leave you with one final thought. For the last uh, week, Bernout has been here, and I've been witnessing him making a cloud in the green room of the Veterans Building, which is on the second floor of that building and overlooks um, a balcony that overlooks City Hall. Perhaps many of you have been there for private functions. It's an extraordinary room. It was in sort of the it's the sort of American Pizza Hut version of um, the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. <laughs> One might say it's a gorgeous, <laughs> it's a gorgeous room, um, and um, we were reviewing the final edit of this new piece that will enter into the Nimbus series, um, and it'll be on view. Um, at the gallery in a couple of weeks. So again, watch your email and we'll let you know when it arrives and you can come look at it. Um, there'll be two different images chosen from this large multi-day photo shoot. One is um, a large print, again, that'll be on view in the gallery and is an edition of six. Um, and then um, we've been sort of talking about edition size. But then there'll be a version that is about this big, that is an edition of 30 and available for purchase at a very affordable price. So let us know if you're interested in that and watch your email and the funds uh, will go to both support the artist and support the programs at the Arts Commission as we move forward. Um, so sign up for our e-blast, keep in touch, and thank you so much for coming tonight. We'll hang out for just a little bit and answer questions, and um, do come by and see the exhibition Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 5. Thank you so much. <laughs>